This episode's made possible by Planful. Hi, it's Tony Bohr, CFO of BlackBod, and you're listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 936. You know, we did time and motion studies in our restaurants, and we spent a lot of time looking at um, those type of aspects, gathering a lot of data, looking at the conveyance in the kitchen and all those things. And yeah, we're, lo and behold, you know, in the back half of 2024, we're going to build a much smaller restaurant. And it's going to have not only benefits on the cost side and the return side for investors, but on, on the team members end, it's going to be easier for them to work and convey. And, and a Portillo's kitchen is very long and it's big. And so getting that engine right in the car was super important to us. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with Michelle Hook, CFO of Pertillo's. It was late 2020 when Michelle Hook and its 17 years of fruitful career building at Domino's to accept a CFO appointment at Midwestern restaurant chain Pertillo's. Fast forward 15 months when the Omicron variant was still grabbing headlines and inflation had begun to rattle the economy. Hook tells us she could not escape the notion that the traditional Portillo's restaurant model needed to change for the post-COVID world. The subject soon surfaced at an executive strategy session and Hook, along with Portillo's head of marketing, was soon tasked with leading an initiative dubbed the Restaurant of the Future. You'll hear about that project and much more on today's episode. We'll begin after this. Hi, I'm Rowan Tonkin, Chief Marketing Officer at Planful, and we're a proud sponsor of CFO Thought Leader. At Planful, we're empowering teams just like yours to drive peak financial performance in every corner of your business. What sets Planful apart? We have purpose-built applications for every department, from FP&A to accounting, marketing to HR, all with built-in financial intelligence. This means we can get you up and running within weeks, and it requires minimal IT involvement. So you can rapidly and seamlessly engage everyone across the business in your key financial processes. Best of all, you can't outgrow us. We take the pain of growing away with an unmatched ability to scale with you. You have an endless runway with Planful. See why over 1,300 customers around the world choose Planful as their flexible, user-friendly, end-to-end financial performance management platform. Go to planful.com and see how you can make financial performance a team sport in your business. Hello, we're speaking to Michelle Hook. CFO of Pertillo's. Michelle, welcome. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Michelle, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to begin where we always do, which is to put you on the spot, ask you to look back for us, and try to identify some of those experiences you feel really prepared you to become a finance leader. What comes to mind? Yeah, a- absolutely. So, I've I've enjoyed my run Jack, but for me, my career just from the beginning starts out with my experience I had in public accounting at Arthur Anderson. So right out of Michigan State, I went to work at then one of the big six firms. And um, as most listeners or you might know, those are excruciating hours that you work in public accounting. So think, you know, 80 hour work weeks. Um, But I can tell you that I wouldn't change a thing. I think I just learned a ton about how business works. I really learned how to lead. I think about, you know, I'm less than a year out of school and I'm managing teams. I'm managing audit teams, right? As a 22 year old um, uh, person right out of school, I'm, I'm leading and managing audit engagements. And so for me, it was putting myself in that leader position early on, which was not comfortable. All the while where I'm still trying to learn how the world works, how business works. Can I ask what geography were you in? 
uh, were you in? So I worked at, yeah, I worked out of the Detroit office at Arthur Anderson. And so most of my clients were uh, based in the Detroit area. And so think very heavy automotive clients, right? And things of that nature. And so for me, I think when I think back, the other thing that I learned is where my passions lied and what mattered to me most, right? And so when I think back to that time, I knew pretty quickly that I didn't want to be an auditor in my career. But at the time, I had to spend two years in public accounting to get my CPA. So I had to, quote unquote, do my time, right? Which I, I again, I wouldn't change a thing, but I did have the experience to work on a number of different audit clients and industries, whether it's automotive or healthcare or public universities. Uh, But actually, one of my audit clients ended up being Domino's Pizza, which we'll get to, I know, uh, in a few in terms of, you know, how that changed my trajectory in my career. But um, I had a chance to, you know, see that industry and feel what that was about. And I grew up working in food service and I worked at McDonald's in high school and worked retail in college and things of that nature. So that really spoke to me. So um, I put in three years at Arthur Anderson. I was very successful there. Um, I remember when I told them I was leaving, the uh, uh, head of HR said, I think you're making a mistake. And I said, well, I don't think so. And um, so I went to another company called Wholesome, uh, which ended up being a position that I followed my mentor to. And they need they were starting up a financial analyst group, and that spoke to me. Um, but I'd say what I learned there is just, again, putting myself in uh, positions to run towards challenges. So I spent about three and a half years there. And the thing that stands out to me there is uh, one of their largest plants in Texas, uh, essentially the entire accounting staff left. And I you know, my, I grew, I had been growing up doing, you know, auditing accounting. And so I raised my hand and I said, look, I'll, I'll go into that plan as the temporary controller and help to stabilize things. So I spent about a year going back and forth uh, between Detroit and Texas and helping to stabilize that uh, accounting team and that function at their largest plant. And uh, all the while, where, where, while I was at Wholesome, um, I stayed in contact with a former colleague Uh, that I worked with on the Domino's audit. Uh, He eventually went to Domino's and became the controller. Uh, He had left Arthur Anderson. And for about two years, Jack, he would call me and try and lure me over to Domino's to come work with him. And, you know, he said, look, I worked on the acquisition uh, on the audit side when Domino's was sold Uh, Tom Monahan sold the company to Bain Capital. And so he said, look, Michelle, I know you know this company. I know you know that Bain owns us. They're a great um, uh, PE firm and we want to go public. And I know you know public company reporting. I know you know all these things and I want you to come work with me. So he, you know, again, it was it was years in the making. But in 2003, I took the leap and went um, to work for, with him at Domino's and he created a role for me, you know, a manager in the accounting group. Um, and then, um, over the course of my 18 year career, did, just did a number of different things, but, you know, a couple things stood out to me. We IPO would in 2004. So I had a chance to work on that. We were one of the um, first companies to do a whole business securitization in the restaurant sector. So had a chance to work on that in 2007. Um, but basically after I was there 10 years, I woke up and said, look, I had been doing like core accounting and financial reporting for 10 years and running all the different uh, layers of accounting, doing the financial reporting, writing the 10Ks, the 10Qs. And I said, I just, I want to do something different. I feel like I'm not being, like I'm not challenging myself enough. And so I remember going into the CFO's office and saying, look, I want to do something different. I want to get out of accounting and reporting. And I don't know what that is, but I'm hoping we can figure this out. And he was very open. He said, Michelle, absolutely, we'll figure this out. And I said, great. Well, while we're doing that, I'm going to go back to school and get my MBA, (laughs) which was, you know, at the time, you know, seems a bit crazy. It wasn't like they forced me to do that or said, you have to do that to get here. And I said, look, I I now know in my head that I want to be a CFO someday. And I know that if I want to do that, that I need to branch out. I need to learn more about other aspects of business, particularly operations. 
And what I also know is when I look at, you know, folks that sit in that chair, you know, largely speaking, most of them have done what I want to do, which is go back to school and, you know, get their MBA and and use what they learn, right? Because I'm 15 years into my career at this point, Jack. So I have two small kids, you know, going back to school, it's like... Can, can I ask you something? Let, let yeah. Me, and, and I want to let the um, the listeners know, again, you arrived there in, in 2003, and again, we're jump forward 10 years. It's like 2013 or what have you, uh, two kids. And, and you're thinking about going back for your MBA, which you do, uh, you go to Michigan. Is that right? That's now, how correct. do you do that? Is that night or did you take off some time? Did they allow you to, uh, because you continue on. I know that you come back at Domino's and within a short period of getting your degree, I think you're a vice president of finance. Am I right? That So it opened some doors for you, no question. Yeah, it definitely did. And so Michigan and, and the larger universities that are strong in business have an executive MBA program. So they tailor the program specifically for people like me who have generally, the profile is, is you've been, you've been in the workforce for about 15 plus years. And it's a 20 month program. And essentially you go full, full, uh, full steam during those 20 months. You're required to be on campus once a month during a weekend session. And then during the other weeks or days during the month, you're working uh, with your teams or individually on all your classwork. So essentially they set it up and they spoon feed you what classes you have to take, when you have to take them and all those things, because they know that we're also working full time. So most of the people in that program are working full time, have been out of school, undergrad 15 plus years. And so um, that's why the program's tailored to that. And look, picking U of M was an easy decision for me. It's a top 10 business school, and it was right down the street from Domino's headquarters in Ann Arbor. And so, and Domino's was very supportive. I remember my CFO at the time telling me, you don't have to do this, Michelle. And I said, no, I, I actually do. And this is what I, I want to do. And they, were, again, were very supportive. At the time, was there anybody in the executive ranks who had done the same? And, and uh, so you had, so yeah, there were some good evidence out there that this was a great path for you to take. I want to, I want to just st- step back a little in time for you because there's a bigger overriding question that uh, I always like to serve up for folks who have very long tenures, like you, you did all totaled 17 years uh, at, at Domino's starting out, you left Anderson, as you explained to us, it was really the dot-com era. There was a lot of attractive dot-coms that were giving away stock options and what have you. And I think it speaks to you. You understood the value of a mentor or having somebody who's welcoming you into the organization who knew, you know, that person, you trust it. And likewise, they knew you were a trusted entity. That was obvious eclipsed any wild ideas of getting rich from the dot-coms or what have you, because I know there were opportunities. You could have gone that path. So many people did. Absolutely. And I think you'll notice both from my jump from Anderson to Wholesome and then Wholesome to Domino's, both of those jumps were, you know, people that I knew that knew me that I went to work with. And so, yeah, for me, it was an easy decision to follow someone that I trusted because what's important to me is the culture that I work in and working with people that, you know, I trust and I enjoy to work with. We all spend a lot of time at work and we spend a lot of time with the people that we work with. So being in an environment and an atmosphere that I enjoy and um, working with those people is super important to me because one of the learnings I had from Anderson was I had a chance to see so many different cultures, Jack, because, you know, auditors just park themselves right into an office within the culture of the companies that they're auditing. And just having those three years and a chance to see different cultures, like you, I learned at least what I didn't want to be a part of, yeah. right? So you see and you learn a lot from, from that. And so for me, following people that I trusted, that I knew were going to build solid cultures, far outweighed the lure of you know more money or more title or more equity anywhere else. Um, so that was important to me. Let me list, and, and uh, again, titles aren't what, what is important really, but I just want to show how you climbed the traditional ladder. You sort of joined them as a senior manager of corporate accounting and reporting. You were a manager, a unit controller, 
Uh, you were a director, uh, a corporate controller, director, assistant corporate controller, director of finance, supply chain. And again, after that, you get into much more senior ranks after you get your MBA. But you you wore a lot of hats. You were steadily, uh, you know, promoted or, or had new opportunities yeah. come your way. Um, at the same time, there must have been seven years in <laughs> the seven year itch. Where yeah. recruiter came and said, you know, uh, there were opportunities. I, I don't know if you were thinking you wanted to be a CFO yet, really. And and again, you're starting a family, no doubt, around that time. You know, what are you thinking? Are you? Was there ever a time where there was a possibility you would have left? Yeah, no. Look, my my mindset was always about growing and developing in my career first and foremost. Yeah. Right. I never had a thought of. I know there's a lot of women that once they have children, end up exiting the workplace. But that, you know, my mindset was always about growing and developing my career and putting myself in a position to where I was always learning. Right. And to your point, there were, you know, different spans and layers that I did at Domino's and always running towards new opportunities. I can say this, I never, yes, I would get calls from recruiters all the time, just like, you know, I do now or did, you know, five years ago, whenever. But I never thought about leaving or taking those calls because I was always being challenged, whether it was even at a certain level. It's, hey, Michelle, can you go and tackle this project? Hey, Michelle, let's look at this process. Hey, I need you to go fix this or do this. Hey, we're because with growing companies too, Jack, I think one of the things that's fun about that is that there's so much opportunity and so much to do. And, you know, as Domino's, continued to grow. I was there during a time period where they morphed into a tech company, right? When I joined the IT department, right, was probably 20 to 30 people that, you know, was operated more like a help desk that would, you know, fix your PC and connect this or that. I mean, by the time I left, I, I think it was like 600 plus people, right, that worked in IT. And they were a tech company that, you know, developed their own tech and, you know, sold that to their franchisees. And it was just watching that morph into what it was, was pretty awesome. Let me ask about, and, and again, you, you shared the timeline with us. So it went public shortly after your arrival or a year mm-hmm. or two within your arrival. Uh, yeah. But as you progress up, you do uh, get some investor relations experience. Yeah. And I think that's after your MBA, but clarify for us, yeah. um, how were you able to get that experience? Yes. Yeah, so once I, you know, after that 10 year mark where I said, look, I need to get out of core accounting and reporting, right? I started to go into more operational FPA roles, whether it was in supply chain or other parts of the business. And then ultimately, which led me to running global FPA for the organization. And so during that time period is when I really started to get involved with. Uh, prepping our CFO and CEO for the quarterly earnings calls for investor meetings, just whatever they needed, right? At, during those quarterly calls, I would be in the room, right? Helping to spoon feed answers to questions or, you know, prepping them, those sorts of things. And then ultimately, right before I left to running IR, right? Which meant that I was interacting, you know, directly with the analysts um, and investors and having those meetings, Um, Now, on the other side of the equation, too, I was treasurer for three years, which meant I interacted with debt investors for um, those three years. So it's a different conversation, debt versus equity investors. And so I like to think even during those three years I spent doing treasury, um, I did a lot of IR on the debt side and educating people on that. And so for me, it just puts you in a position to where you're comfortable Right. Once once I was able to get outside of, again, that core accounting and financial reporting and really dive into the different aspects of the operations of the business, it was very easy to talk to and message and prep. And remember, I have all the core knowledge about how the numbers work and how the financial statements move. I tell people this all the time, Jack. I say, look, accountants can morph into finance people. That's very easy for accountants to do because we understand Right. I say I'm a, I'm a recovering accountant, but we understand the core financial statements. We understand debits and credits. We understand our numbers move. If you understand that, you can understand anything in finance. It's a lot more difficult. And this is my personal opinion. It's more difficult for someone who studies core finance to then go back and say, oh, do I really understand core accounting principles? Right. 
And so for me, any question that people ask me, whether it was back then or even now at Portillo's, I joke with my accounting team all the time. I'm like, there's probably nothing you're going to get by me in terms of, you know, what's going on in the financials or if you want to talk technical accounting or, you know, as I look at the detailed P&Ls, all those things, I'm going to be able to probably ask some good questions that, you know, stems from, you know, just where my core is. As, as you shared with us how Domino's really became a technology company in a sense, um, I'm curious on the uh, perhaps conference calls uh, in the investor relations realm, um, were there new metrics that you were trying to reveal uh, to investors and analysts, how the company was really evolving? And I'm thinking of the mobile world as well as yeah. the mobile world came along. So you were discussing numbers that weren't necessarily financial any longer, just how many You're people right. downloaded the app or what, yep. you know, what was, what became uh, the types of metrics you used to tell the story to better reveal how Domino's was evolving? Anything come to mind yeah. in terms of what you would do? Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I think to your point, you start to talk more about what you're seeing in the underlying data around the guest experience, right? And so... I think one of the early learnings that we had very early on was, you know, Domino's, we, we had some hiccups, um, you know, during the 2006, 2007, you know, and then you lead into the Great Recession. And so one of the learnings once, you know, we had the data and the information was that, you know, we were just taking too much price and that we had to drive um, sales through transactions or traffic in the restaurants. And it seems like silly to say that now, but that was a lesson that, you know, as a big organization, right, you understanding those dynamics, you know, wasn't easy when you didn't have the data. And then as you got the data, right, because it's a large, large franchise organization. And so you have to make sure you have the franchise information to disseminate, you know, to dissect this information. And so we started to talk more about what, uh, the frequency of visits were, um, you know, what that to your point, the downloads of the apps, the conversion rate, um, as we talked about different offerings from a marketing standpoint, we would have these things called boost weeks, which I know they I believe they just kicked off again this year, which were meant to drive traffic in the restaurants. So we would talk about, you know, what those boost weeks would drive and then how that converted um, the guests to more frequency of orders and how that that was a tactic to drive that frequency. So we would start to talk more about that, um, you know, and, and how that was driving sales versus just let me tell you what the revenue numbers are, what the changes, things like that. You know, we started to talk about how technology played a role in driving traffic. And so you look at the trajectory, you know, of what they had done. It was all driven by technology, whether it was um, the pizza tracker at the time was pretty revolutionary in terms of, you know, you being able to go on your app and track your order, right? Whether it's in the oven, it's out for delivery. And so talking about things like that and investments, when you take it from a finance lens, making investments in technology and those initiatives and why it made sense, because then you tie it back to the payback, right? The payback of driving the, the frequency of that guest um, clearly, you know, pays, pays for itself the investments that they were making in the technology platforms. And as someone overseeing FP&A, uh, you, you are connecting the dots for everyone, uh, as you just described, I would imagine. Yeah. I was trying. <laughs> uh, but um, so what is interesting as well to me is that, um, like so many uh senior professionals, there was movement during COVID. And of course, you opt, uh, you step into a CFO role uh, yep. during COVID uh, of December 2020. I don't want to tip our hand yep. too much yep. uh, because you were there at Domino's when COVID arrived. And um, is this a chapter we can talk a little bit about? Um, uh, because I, I just can't imagine, uh, again, for all of us to think a little bit back in time, it seems ages ago now, but that first quarter when it arrived and all the uncertainty around that, share with us some of what was happening at, at Domino's. Yeah, like everyone else, right? We were determining how we needed to pivot uh, with in terms of the business. And so the good news for us uh, at the time, for them at the time, was that uh, the vast majority of the business, right, is clearly what I would call off-prem right dining it's not like 
Domino's has the dining rooms that have to That's shut right. down, right? And and need to worry about that. So Domino's actually was a business that thrived during COVID. But one of the things that needed pivoting was, okay, I used to, as an example, come and hand you your pizza at the door, right? Well, what am I going to do now? Do I drop? How do I know that you don't want you don't want that now? So you know, do I just drop it at your door? How does this work? So, and then tying in the technology, right, in terms of what the what the guest choice is, in terms of how they want to receive the food, um, was one of the things that we had to think about. Um, and then really keeping the team members safe. I think that was a big concern as well, and continued to be a concern here at Portillo's as we were navigating through that as well, is how do you not just keep your guests safe, but how do you keep your own internal team members safe? And so when you think about getting that PPE equipment, right, that everyone was scrambling to get, getting hand sanitizers into your restaurants, just even the distance that the workers in the restaurants were working within each other. If the restaurant industry, you know, if you go into a kitchen, you know, you're going to see a lot of people working side by side in the kitchens. You know, they're generally not working six feet apart. So how do we make sure that we staff the restaurants appropriately, right, so that there's enough distance to work, but still, um, you know, be able to service the guests? And then getting people comfortable coming to work, Jack, right? I mean, to your point, you think about that time where there was a lot of unknowns and the restaurant industry was one that, you know, didn't completely shut down, right? And so we had to make sure that our team members felt safe coming to work and that we were providing them with the protective equipment that made them feel safe. So those were some of the challenges that we dealt with the Domino's that even when, when I left and came here to Portillo's, it was the same challenges that we saw here too. Well, we might have a few more career related questions. I, I, I am curious whether there was a recruiter involved that ultimately, or was it a relationship or how did it come to be? And then we'll ask you about Portillo's, but I'm wondering when, yeah, uh, the epic decision after 17 years uh, with one company, it's not a light decision to make. No. Uh, what, how how uh, some of the dynamics behind it, can you share? Yeah, absolutely. So it was both uh, relationships and a recruiter. So uh, the funny story here is that the recruiter called me and told me about the opportunity or sent me a note, email, LinkedIn. And I said, no, I'm not interested. Like, I'm not interested in leaving Domino's. I love it here. And I did. I loved it there. I loved the people. I thought, you know, it was a great place to work. I mean, I wouldn't have stayed there for 17 years if it wasn't. And I said, no, I'm not interested. And so um, someone that I trusted, you know, a mentor of mine um, had had a conversation with Berkshire Partners, the PE firm that owned Portillo's. Um, and they were talking about how they were looking for a CFO and that person said, well, you need to talk to Michelle. She'd be perfect. And they said, well, we tried to contact her through the recruiter and she told us no. And he said, well, let me talk to her. And so he called me and said, hey, I really think that you need to look into this opportunity. I think it's perfect for you. And I said, OK, I trust you. If you tell me to have the conversation, I'll have the conversation. Um, and so I had the conversation, Jack, with the recruiter. And I look, I knew Portillo's. I'm a Midwestern girl, grew up in Michigan. I spent a lot of time going to Chicago back and forth. And I love, I'm, my husband will tell you that I was meant to be here because um, as soon as I crossed the border into Illinois, I would always say I had to have an Italian beef sandwich. Um, so I knew the brand. Um, once I learned more about what you know they were from a growth standpoint of cash flow standpoint. And then more important for me was the people. Um, and I remember having the first conversation with our CEO and I said, there's only two things I need to, that, that would, um, cause me to leave Domino's is that, um, I have to be passionate about the brand and I have to fit the culture. I said, I don't care about going to a big company. I don't care about having X, Y, and Z. Those are the two things that I'm looking for. And look, in the back of my head, Jack, I always thought like I'd take everything that I learned at Domino's and take it to a smaller company and help grow that company. That was always like in the back of my head, like that's what I wanted to do. And so I said, passion for the brand, fit the culture. So the brand passion was definitely there, as I told you before. And then I had to take a leap of faith with the culture. I met the, our CEO, Michael Asanlu, and immediately said, this is someone I absolutely want to work for and I think I have to work for. Um, but the funny thing is, is I didn't actually step foot into our office, our headquarters until the first day on the job because it was COVID. 
And there was, you know, nobody was in the office. There was no vaccine yet. It was no vaccine. Yep. I had to take a leap of faith based on Zoom calls and interviews and only meeting our CEO in person. Yeah. So, and forgive me, some of our listeners might not have a Pertillo's near them, near them. So please let me ask just a broad question. Tell us about Pertillo's, what sets it apart? What are its offerings really about? Yeah, no problem. We are actually a 60 year old uh, restaurant brand that started here in Chicago in uh, 1963. Our founder, Dick Portillo, uh, started us out of a little um, shack we call the doghouse. And um, we've been uh, we've been growing. Um, sent, particularly, we've accelerated growth since uh, Dick sold the company to Berkshire Partners in 2014, and uh, we went public and IPO'd in October of 2021. Um, but we're at we're at 78 restaurants today, and we have in nine states with a growing national presence. Now, here's what here's why I think we're special in the restaurant industry, and why you know I left an amazing brand like Domino's to come here. I think you know there's some differentiators for Portillo's. First, I think we have a very distinctive and diverse menu that offers something for everyone. And when you think about nationally, I get this question all the time, Jack, well, who's who's a national competitor to Portillo's? Unlike pizza, where you can point to different national competitors, whether it's Papa John's or Little Caesars or Pizza Hut, you know, same thing with tacos, chicken, et cetera. I can't with Portillo's. So my answer generally is everybody, particularly in QSR and fast casual. And I think we're a, we're definitely a hybrid between QSR, fast casual, some elements of casual dining. So our restaurants have a very energetic and engaging atmosphere when you go to dine in. When you walk into a Portillo's, each one is unique to that local environment. So you'll walk in, you'll see a bunch of, um, you know, what I call tchotchkes on the wall and things that'll give you a sense that you're in the local community restaurant. You're going to smell you know, the flavors of Portillo's, you're going to hear music playing, it's going to be a very vibrant atmosphere. Um, The second thing I would say is that I think, you know, we were definitely multi channel before it was a thing. And so Portillo's, you know, has dine in, we have double drive throughs um, in all of our restaurants, we do all of the off prem delivery, we have a, a, a pretty good catering business as well. And, but I think what's most important, what's a, a very A big differentiator for us is our culture. And I told you that was important to me, right? In terms of what would take, what it would take for me to leave Domino's. It's a differentiator for me. It's very values based. Our values are family, greatness, energy, and fun. And we, we do values based hiring. And I I feel like those aren't just words on a piece of paper or wall, but that we live and breathe those every day. And so I think about when you create that values based culture, and you're going to interact, not with me when you go and, you know, eat at Portillo's, but you're going to interact with that frontline team member. So if we take care of the, our team members, they're going to take care of the guests and that'll ultimately take care of the shareholders, which I view as, you know, that virtuous cycle. Um, for those that don't know our menu, our food, it, you can't have a good restaurant concept, Jack, unless you have craveable food. Our food is craveable. Think of Chicago favorites like Italian beef, Chicago hot dogs, our burgers are fantastic, French fries, onion rings. Um, We have a a very uh, good line of salads that some people are surprised by. But, you know, our I think our average restaurant, Jack, sells like almost 700,000 in just salads. So our average AUV of eight and a half million right now for a fast, casual QSR restaurant concept is unheard of. It's on the only. I think concept that can touch us is probably Chick-fil-A in terms of that AUV and that, that volume that we do is just unprecedented in the industry, which is fascinating to me. Let me ask you something about culture because you shared with us, okay, there was the, the initial uh, company was sold. There's a transaction there. There's always, you know, will it keep its culture? Will it change under a new ownership? Then the company goes public. It becomes a publicly traded company. Uh, again, sort of a, has a, might have an impact on culture, might not. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, Michelle Hook, who's accustomed uh, to the Domino's, uh, you know, a publicly traded uh, company might understand the different nuances of the culture of a publicly traded 
uh, restaurant company. How am I doing? Am- you're good. You're it seems good. like you could play an important role here in given your past experience as a leader in a publicly traded company. Yeah, I think it's important that we are a 60 year old brand, but in some ways we're just learning in the, you know, crawl, walk, run phase. We're just learning how to walk with certain processes, right? And so for me, there's a lot of opportunity to continue to create scalable processes here at this brand. And so that's the lens that, you know, I've been trying to bring to the brand in terms of saying, okay, we're doing it this way. And, you know, we're at a clip of growing 10% plus restaurants a year. As we scale, we can't continue to work this way, right? And so thinking about whether it's in finance, whether it's in the development cycle, whether it's in, you know, our IT department, our supply chain, right? All those areas have processes that, we're used to running a certain way, but now that we're, you know, we continue to bolster growth, need to be scalable. But you can't, it's so important to me that you can't lose those values of family greatness, energy, and fun. And so you always have to be rooted into the core of, you know, what you're doing and how you go about doing things, I think is important, not just the end goal of, hey, I need to get from here to there, but how you get from here to there, I think is important, which involves, you know, how you treat people, how you communicate, how you build teams, how you build relationships. All those things come into play for me when you talk about culture and then creating, again, those scalable processes. The good news for me, right, is that I I have seen great, right, at Domino's. And so how do I bring those learnings here and, you know, create that greatness in certain aspects of the business here? Because the business, the core business here at Portello's is fantastic. Again, you don't do the AUVs that we do if you don't have a fantastic restaurant concept, um, which is what we have. Our job is to scale this brand, but do it in a way that is, you know, pays homage to the brand history and that we don't lose that. And so it's important to us as we continue to grow It's why, Jack, we don't open a Portillo's unless it has an experienced general manager running the restaurant, because we need to make sure that the culture permeates through all of our restaurants, which are all company owned. We're not a franchise operation, so we control this, and we need to make sure that we maintain that within our restaurants. Well, let me ask you then, again, when the company we know went public, there was quarterly reporting, Mm -hmm. there were you know, certain numbers that had to be produced regularly. But from a larger sort of cultural standpoint, I'm wondering if there was a number or a metric that you needed to educate the organization more broadly about. And in some ways, and maybe not, it bumped up against culture at times uh, that you needed to, and again, maybe it was, you know, you had to have 20 conversations with different managers across the company to really get them to understand why here. I'm just thinking there had to be some priority or metric that you didn't think uh, enough of the organization uh, was paying attention to or enough attention to anything. Well, You know, I will credit our COO Derek Pratt with, you know, helping to facilitate a lot of, you know, what I'm about to say, which is, you know, he created a culture where, you know, he coins the term, we want to be brilliant at the basics. He talks about metrics that matter. And so Derek joined the brand in September of 2020, right before I did. So, you know, Derek and I have been locked up in terms of, well, what are those metrics that matter? And for me, how can I support him in getting that information out there and disseminate it in a way that's not overwhelming to the business? Because I think one of the things that I noticed Jack, when I first got here, which Derek did as well, was that there was a lot of, I'll call it canned reports going out to the field and a lot, you know, information that, you know, my question was, is does anyone even read this, right? There's a lot of information. It's almost too much. And so partnering with Derek and getting him being, you know, helping to be that thought leader with me and well, what are those metrics? So we started to talk a lot about um, what I would call guest satisfaction metrics, So we talk about OSAT, overall satisfaction scores, and then there's subsets of that, order accuracy, speed of service, cleanliness of your restaurant. And then you start to layer in, you know, value perception scores, 
that necessarily wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't uh, get into the metrics of matter report, but we started to create this reporting framework, which had these various metrics that we wanted them to focus on because we knew if they did, there was a high correlation to sales, right? And so if you do these things and you take care of the guest, guess what's going to happen? They're going to come back to your restaurant, right? And so getting the um, field educated on that was something that Derek was very passionate about. And I w- I played a, a, a support role in my group did in, in helping to develop the content and the reports and then disseminating it and then giving our insights, frankly, right? My team, I think, dived in and said, look, we're going to give some insights. We're going to identify, you know, restaurants that we think um, need a little bit more attention than others. And so that's how we've you know, tried to work that in. And we've worked a little bit into that, into our external messaging, Jack, to answer your question. So you're here, you'll hear Michael and I talk about, you know, our OSAT scores, our value perception scores are the highest that they've been in several years, despite being in, you know, a recessionary like environment and an environment that's has a lot of headwinds for restaurants. We use that as a metric we talk about externally and how we feel good about the health of the business. So that's how we tie it in externally and how we talk about it internally. Yeah, we, we'd imagine your, your FP&A team isn't quite the size <laughs> of Domino's. No. And, uh, we're curious how you, maybe you organized it differently or you realized you could leverage it more yeah. if it was organized differently in some yeah. way. Can you share with us what how FP&A? Yeah. So I um I brought in we have a we had a, a strong FP&A team when I joined. There needed the work needed to be done on more of the accounting financial reporting side. Um, but the folks that we had in FP&A were very strong and they remain very strong. They needed a you know outside of myself, right? I brought in a new VP of FP&A. Um, and Kyle joined us um, over a year ago, and he's been great. But one of the things that you know I aligned with Kyle on early on is how I viewed FPNA, which is you know there's an aspect of FPNA which I'll call it operational FPNA, Jack, and that's the FPNA that supports the business. I'm going to work with you know the the restaurant operators. I'm going to work with um, my HR team, supply chain, whatever parts of the business. I'm going to work with you on your business needs. And then there's corporate FPNA. Right, corporate FPA is Michelle needs board materials. I need prep for the quarterly earnings calls. Um, we're doing a development day next week, right, in Dallas. I need some materials prep for that. I need analysis done for that, right? That's what I would call more corporate FPA. And so, you know, Kyle has really worked to align his resources on FPA to those different work streams. And then really making sure that our business partners, again, whether it's on the app side, the HR side, IT, have a business partner to work with on the FP&A team that knows their business that they can go to when they have questions or need some analysis done. So that's how I view the world. Um, Again, it's a small, lean, but powerful team. They get a lot done. Well, thank you for that. I want to jump to our finance strategic moment question. Uh, which is we're just looking for one moment of insight that you've experienced along the way. We know it's a rather broad and random question in some ways, but anything come to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm going to pick one that's actually more recent. There's many moments back in time for me that I could point to, Jack. But recently, you know, since my time here at Portillo's, we we had an executive strategy session, which I'd say was about a year and a half ago. And this is a time, right, where you're you're coming off of, um, you know, Omicron and you're starting to hit some of that heavy inflationary period in the business. Right. And so we start, you know, we were just talking about the restaurant performance um, overall, but more importantly, how we were working. And then that led into how we were building our restaurants, right, the size of the restaurants. And from my lens. You know, yes, Portillo's does fantastic AUVs, but I always, and this was just M- Michelle's personal lens, I would, a- I always thought that there were some aspects of our restaurants that were overbuilt. And so I came from Domino's, right, which is a lens of they didn't have these big dining rooms and most of their business, they had a heavy digital business. Portillo's business is 20% digital. And so for me, 
post COVID, our, our dine in business went from 50% to about 35%. So there was an aspect of me that as we were having these conversations, you know, I thought to myself, I, I think we're overbuilding our restaurants. I, you know, I, and I think as the, where the puck's going is what we need to think about, because I think that dynamic isn't going to change. So our CEO said, great, Michelle, you and our head of marketing are going to lead the project and we're going to call it restaurant of the future. And you guys are going to go figure that out. So for the last year and a half, we've been figuring that out and um, it's been an awesome project. It's been very cross-functional. You know, this isn't like a finance person's comfort zone, but I think one of the things that Michael, our CEO realized is, you know, it wasn't a something where I had, you know, I had something in my head that it, it needed to be that way, right? I wasn't an operational person, you know, so I take it very much with a data-driven lens. You know, we did time and motion studies in our restaurants and we spent a lot of time looking at um, those type of aspects, gathering a lot of data, looking at the conveyance in the kitchen and all those things. And yeah, we're, lo and behold, you know, in the back half of 2024, we're gonna build a much smaller restaurant. And it's going to have not only benefits on the cost side and the return side for investors, but on our team member, on the team members end, it's going to be easier for them to work and convey. And, and a Portillo's kitchen is very long and it's big. And so getting that engine right in the car was super important to us. But for me, that wasn't like a, a finance specific project, but I think it's going to drive tremendous change in our organization as we move forward. And I really do believe it's going to be a game changer for Portillo's. And, and we're going to, you know, talk about that a lot at our development day next week with our analysts and investors. But um, I do think that that's going to be a big uh, shift for us. From episode 822, this is One Minute with CFO Peter Walker of Sterling. In that current state, I did not have visibility into my gross margin by client. So while I priced a client deal, I didn't know how much I was actually making on the client deal once their program was in place. So the other thing that I did was in the API integration with the data providers is I tagged the actual client in that API and then I created the automation on the back end so that I was able to not only, you know, say, hundreds of hours in invoice reconciliation that's a totally non-value added activity to an organization but i was also able to create client level pnls that now i can sit down with my business leaders and have a conversation around We are going to jump to our mentoring round where I'll ask you several quick questions intended to inform and inspire future finance leaders. We'd like to know about your first 60 days. We touched on this earlier as CFO. At when you just stepped into the role, there must have been something you wish you know, someone had told you. <laughs> Here you were staring at the role for years, thinking you know all of what it might be about. But that first 60 days, if you could go back in time and just Tell yourself something. What would it have been? Um, well, I and look, Michael has been, you know, he he laughs about it now, but he he's been honest with me, you know, post. He's like, you had a little work to do on your team, right? So structurally, right, we were not set up to be a publicly ran finance organization. So um, yeah. that was pretty apparent to me um, even before I joined and saw the org chart. To be honest with you, Jack. And so, you know, those were things that, you know, there were some things I had to do more immediate and then some things that, you know, I had to align with Michael on that we needed to start um, looking for external resources to supplement just to put us in a position to be able to, again, do what we did in 21, which was go public and then post public, be able to handle, right, all the aspects of public company reporting, et cetera. So, you know, those, I guess... I didn't know like the extent of it before I started. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't everywhere. Like I said, my FP and A team was fantastic. So, you know, and then there was other gaps that had to be filled in, um, et cetera. So that took a little bit of work and effort just to get the the people 
in that um, we needed to because we didn't have certain capabilities. And it wasn't that the people that we had here in any way were bad or, you know, that we needed to exit them. It was just playing to people's strengths and then supplementing resources with other capabilities. And so those were more the early, like first 60 to 90 days, just trying to set the organization and the finance organization up for success as we moved into the future, which I knew involved at some point because we didn't decide that we were going to IPO Jack until May of 2021. It was a very fast paced yeah. process. Um, and so those were conversations I was having, you know, in the January, February, March timeframe, even before we decided to go public. Um, so those were some of the early learnings for me. Um, but I tried to spend a lot of time just getting to know the business and being in restaurants and understanding who Portillo's was and what we were about. Nice. Thank you for that. Uh, we always like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side. And um, <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot here. I'm in the middle of re uh, replacing a question here where I usually ask for a personal habit yeah. or part of a daily routine. And I can ask that question. Um, but I also, we, we were getting a lot of the same responses. So, um, I, and, and uh, I'm thinking I'd like to ask you if it's okay, uh, what is something uh that people generally don't know about you, something about you that people generally don't know? Ah, well, here's the thing is one of the things about me that people know is I, I bring my full self to work. Right. And so I'm, I'm very, I'm a very authentic leader. So everyone knows as an example that I love sports. I love Michigan state in particular, right. I'm a movie buff. I love to golf. You know, I love spending time with my family. I love going to the lake and doing all those things. So there's not a lot that, they don't know about me. I'd say, you know, if you look, if you look back, you know, in time and say, okay, are there things that I've not shared? Right. Like, I think one of the cool things that, you know, I sometimes talk to people about is, you know, post-college, I backpacked in Europe for a month. When I was in Switzerland, I, I did this crazy bungee jumping from a cable car that was attached to the Alps. And it was like one of the most amazing experiences in my life. I don't tell that to a lot of people. So I guess, I'll say that's one thing people probably don't know about me is that, you know, I did that trip. Yeah. It had, it was very impactful for me. And, you know, I, I did some things I wouldn't do today. Let me just say that. <laughs> <laughs> no more bungee yeah. jumping, maybe. I, what about, um, would you have a book for us or uh, it doesn't have to be a business book, but just something uh, you've enjoyed or influenced your thinking in one way or the other? Um, you know, one of the, it's kind of an old one, but you know, it's one that came up more recently as we were talking about um, uh, team dynamics. And, and I talked a lot about teams and, you know, how to build healthy teams. So like the five dysfunctions of a team is always interesting to me, right? Because you go back and you talk about, okay, there's that foundation of trust, right? And then it, the pyramid kind of builds from there. And I think it's just really good at its core. And I know it's a little bit older book and I don't know if everyone's really heard about it, but for me, it kind of, it's super easy to read and it just speaks to what is super important to me, which is building healthy teams. And it's why I said to you during my first 16 to 90 days, I was very focused on the team because you can't be successful in anything that you do, especially at these levels. If you don't have a strong team, I think that for me, People have to understand, like I went from, you know, being good. You can be good individually at what you do and fantastic. But if you can't lead, develop, influence, build trust, build relationships, you can never be a, a strong leader at anything that you do. And so I think that's that really has always spoken to me. And if if listeners have not heard about it or I say, just take a peek at it. Where in your career do you wish someone first handed you that book? Oh, I early on for sure. I mean, back in my auditing days at Anderson, right? Because that's all you do is teamwork, right? And especially so, as a young professional, yeah. it would have given you a sense of yes. why team building is so yeah. important. Not really, you're not managing yet, but you would understand I'm part of a, a yeah. Bigger you thing you would here, understand so that yeah. you know you got to build that trust. You got to have accountability, right? to get results and all those things, because everything that you do generally in business is going to involve a team, right? And it's going to yeah. involve that interaction, whether it's your own team, whether it's a cross-functional team, at some point, you're, 
you're not just going to sit in your chair and individually do your job. If you want to be a leader in an organization, there's plenty of jobs where, yes, you will be able to sit there and just, you know, go through the checklist and pound through work every day. But if you want to be a leader, it's a different skill set. Well, you should, I think Patrick Lancioni, the, uh, the author, should speak at your your next annual gathering for free yeah. <laughs> after your endorsement with this one. We are up to our final question, which uh, we ask you to look forward finally. And we're wondering what your priorities are uh, as a finance leader over the next 12 months. What would those yeah, be? Yeah, it's, it's what I mentioned before, Jack, which is continuing to create those scalable processes. We're a fast growing company. Um, we have the Restaurant of the Future project I mentioned. Uh, we just started and kicked off in July a large scale uh, Oracle ERP implementation. So we're refreshing like back of the house. For me, it's we got to have solid foundations established in those core processes. And then you can start bolting on like, you know, fancy things or the shiny new toy, whatever you want to do in the future. But for me, it's creating those scalable processes. Um, I continue to work and partner with our chief development officer on that entire process. As I mentioned, we're growing quick. Development is a massive focus for Portillo's as we move forward. So for me, partnering with our development team, making sure that I'm helping assess the new restaurants, making decisions around how we're building with the restaurant in the future, where we're building, um, is, is a massive priority for me as well as the rest of the leadership team. And then again, the processes on the back end and creating some of those capabilities and systems that are going to grow with us. So those are my priorities over the next 12 months. Michelle Hook, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thanks for having me, Jack. Thought Leader listeners, as you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as Thought Leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at CFOThoughtLeader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.